Just you know that the program was a little bit rescheduled, so we will start with uh, today the presentation of uh, Nicolas du Chateau, and then we will move on with uh, the presentation by uh, Ian Doch. I hope he arrived well. <laughs> I have no news until. <laughs> so, well, you know that I like to introduce a bit the speakers by explaining where they come from and how I know them. So I know Nicolas from Barcelona. I did a PhD. Um, at the University Pompeu Fabra, who happens to be the, the partner now of uh, one of the two partners of Cardo Function. And uh, so Nic Nico did already a PhD that was quite te technical. Uh, he worked on a heart atlasis of motion. So it's a concept that, let's say, very, a concept more for engineers than clinicians usually. But during this PhD, he managed to, uh, to go to the clinics, and let's say, to connect with the clinical. With, with the physicians and to explain what he was doing and get them interested to the point that uh, after his PhD he actually did a one year postdoc in the hospital. So I think it's a very interesting trajectory to have like a technical background, a technical PhD, but then to get the experience in clinics and even more recently you've been working very closely to a physician for a PhD that I was recently at uh, in Inria with Maxim. So Nico is really the, the combination of these two things. Someone very technical, doing crazy statistics, and uh, who likes to talk about deformorphism and all this shit that nobody understands. <coughs> but at the same time, someone, someone who is able to go to the clinic and, uh, and uh, get his work, let's say, uh, deployed in the clinic. <laughs> or at least, yeah, get, get a clinical interaction. So thank you very much. Today you will talk uh, a little bit about machine learning, so statistics in cardiology, but also the connection with uh, synthetic imaging, so it makes the connection with the talk uh, of Olivier. Okay, so, um, yeah, so actually the talk starts with a question, which is why, when doing machine learning, do we need, or would we need, synthetic data, or synthetic databases? So the first thing, what should I do? Oh, next. Yeah, so actually my, I prepared the talk and on Monday evening we had a chat with physicians we work with and uh, it completely changed a bit my, no, it changed rather our point of view on this and the clinicians what they say is uh, simulations are really, really complex. Uh, the real world about data is really complex so we could do everything from data. If we have millions of data, we could do everything and we don't need simulations. So basically, just asking a little joke to MATLAB, why? But basically MATLAB, what MATLAB answers when you ask why, he says, well, the terrified mathematician wanted it. And then you ask again, you said, I told to, and finally he, asks, he answers you that, don't you have something better to do? So the purpose of the talk is really to try to see if really this answer to the question is so categorical or not. So just a quick reminder about uh, machine learning, which is quite trendy now. We have the big field of artificial intelligence that is sold in the media, which is basically the whole th hope of someday having computers that reason like humans. And in between is the machine learning thing, which you, uh, at the beginning, started by uh, saying that it corresponds to computers that learn without being explicitly programming. Which is actually wrong, because what is inside machine learning is a program that we settle uh, properly. So actually, the key point here about the definition of machine learning and deep learning that is in between also, is it's a well-posed learning problem that fulfills this criterion. So we need to learn by experience. So by experience, I mean data. With respect to a given task, so your task is segmentation, is something, but it means there's a score behind, and this score is the performance, the measure. So that's the definition of uh, machine learning I like, but I would highlight then that behind is the data, and that's the key point here. So the question of, our, of the talk is, how many samples do we need? If we, need uh, if we look for synthetic data, it means that we have an issue about how many samples do you need. 
and it's conditioned by the complexity of the question. So imagine you want to do just regression. You have a theoretical curve of a sinus here, and you just know the data for these five samples, the five dots here. So actually, I could do with a model. I, I choose a model, uh, a regression model, and I can do a regression that is not that accurate, but still it's a good approximation. If I have 15 samples, okay, my problem is not really complex, it's a sinusoid, so I can already have a perfect approximation of my, uh, of my curve. So why would I go for so many samples if my problem is not that complex? Okay? So obviously when, talking with, when dealing with images, it gets much more complex. So there's the ImageNet challenge from 2015 already. I was looking to recognize uh, accurately uh, images and to put these images into categories. And the problem is actually very challenging because these images are real-life images, 2D, very varied, and they, they provided 1,000 object classes, which is quite a lot. And for this, actually, well, the database is made of one million of training samples, and testing is also, also quite a lot. So on this, there's so many data, one would wonder, would we need synthetic data? But maybe yes, and actually behind this, there's also probably data aug augmentation schemes just to make the algorithms work better because the problem is already really complex. So you may have a lot of data, you still may be limited by the complexity of the question. Second thing is, well, it's not only the complexity of the question, it's maybe the model itself. Because if I want to do a linear approximation, I just need two samples. That's not so difficult. But if my model is more complex, so if I start like the winner of uh, the ImageNet, like the first networks that were doing this, uh, neural networks, they were quite simple. And then the new challengers are much uh, complex, much more complex architecture. So basically, if there is an increase in complexity in the model, probably there will be a need for much more data. So there's a nice picture just showing um, the challengers of, 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 this, uh, of this challenge. So AlexNet, the initial network is here. So here is the accuracy that is reached. So it started with 55% accuracy. And now the, the recent networks are about 80% accuracy, which is quite impressive. And here is the number of computations that are done. And what's actually interesting is the size of the circles is the number of parameters of the networks. And you see that's like how huge they are getting, like up to uh, 100 millions of parameters. So with this, but you have only, uh, only 1 million of images in your database, then you may understand that the problem is rather complex and challenging for um, having data. Another question that is behind is obviously the dimensional idea of my data. So here is the same problem of regression, okay? but now it's not a 1D curve, it's a 2D curve. So the, data, the dimensionality of the input data is different, but there's also the intrinsic dimensionality of my data, because here the shape that I may want to reconstruct, like the gray shape that is behind, it's not just two-dimensional. Maybe it's conditioned by much more variables. Okay? And with these samples that are depicted here, I may have an approximation of my ground truth, but I'm, it may change that very differently depending on the amount of samples I have. Okay? So complexity of the question, complexity of the model, dimensionality of my data, Obviously, dealing with images, it's much more different, it's much more complex. So 2D images, this amount of pixels, and uh, cardiac images for CNMR, we have this amount of voxels, 3D echo even more. And we tend to forget that these are temporal sequences. It's not only n diastole and systole, there's dynamics that are, I think, understudied for the moment. So the Dimensionality of the input data is very complex, and the intrinsic dimensionality is also really, really complex. And then I, I didn't talk about this, but there may be a noise on my data. So with 100 samples, you remember the exact matching problem was quite oversampled. But yeah, if I have a certain amount of noise on my data, well, 
I still have an approximation with 100 samples and I may need up to uh, 500 samples to get a really perfect approximation of this. Okay, so these were basic examples. So we're keeping this in mind, what to do with cardiac imaging. What basically, the key question is settling your problem for machine learning. So the first question to ask is, do I have, is my data labeled or not? If it's labeled, meaning I know, uh, I'll, I'll show examples afterwards, but if I have labels on my data, I know um, who is healthy, who is pathological in some cases, I fall into the umbrella of supervised learning and I may do regression or classification. I exaggerate a bit, but yes. If I don't have labels, I may want to discover trends in my data or find clusters. So I may do clustering, which is still categorization of my data, or a variability analysis. I may spread my data and try to see. So some examples. Uh, I pick from my, the work I'm involved in, but there's many, many examples. Automatic segmentation, you have in the training set, you have images and segmentations, and you want to predict the segmentation for new images. So what do you think? Is it supervised and supervised? It's supervised, and what's the goal here? Is it regression, classification? Classification, uh, that's it. You want to predict labels for the pixels. Um, then, if you have a population, like you want to see differences between healthy and uh, hypertense uh, hearts. Uh, what do you think? Is it supervised and supervised? supervised? Still supervised, because I know the categories here, and in this case, well, we were focusing on variability analysis. Still, like looking at variability within each population. Uh, this that time we wanted to look for, like if we pick deformation, like strain from echocardiography, could we have uh, a prediction of where is the infarct location? So what do you think? Is this a supervised and supervised problem? And supervised? Oh no, we still have labels, like you still know the correspondence for some training set, for some, some data, we still know that this deformation corresponds to this infarct. Okay, so this is still supervised. Okay, but now the problem is regression, or we, tackle, we handle it from the, the side of regression. Okay, and the last one is like we had a population that we wanted to characterize, so do kind of variability analysis of the population, knowing that it belongs to a given space and compare new samples to this population. So in that case, we were unsupervised because we, want just, we didn't have labels on inside the population, let's say, and we wanted to do variability analysis or eventually clustering in other applications. Okay, so these are the basic issues. I remind that the question is complex and that's a key point here, but actually that's not the only thing. And Actually, the key point here is the complexity of the disease. Because, I mean, you may want to do elaborated things or say, I don't have enough data, I will add synthetic data to my database. But diseases are really complex. So, up to which level our simulations may go with respect to the disease complexities? That's a key challenge. So that's a clinical decision tree, for example, for patients with arctic stenosis. I was looking for a picture to illustrate this and I was quite afraid by, by this kind of picture. It's really, it's not just falling down, but there's a lot of interactions like this. So I'm not sure for the moment with simulations we're able to go this. So we should not be too ambitious and try to reproduce every disease, but maybe really tackle uh, some specific tracks. So some examples. Uh, in the umbrella of manifold learning, which is like you believe that your data belongs to a given space, linear, nonlinear, and you want to estimate this. Well, linearly, you could do principal component analysis, which falls into this umbrella. Okay, so if you have shaped data and you want to see differences between uh, subgroups, you can start by doing linear analysis and looking at the principal modes of variation in your data. Well, that's uh, the idea of principal component analysis. 
you may want to say that, okay, my, I have the feeling that my data belongs to a, a more specific structure, that if I do uh, linear statistics on my data, I will go out uh, from my, my space and I will have unrealistic data that doesn't correspond to my pathology. So you may want to go nonlinear. So that's also, there's a lot of techniques in, inside this. But you can still pursue the same thing, like looking at the variability of the, your data within the space. So starting, for example, here in, the, in this example, the modes of variation of the anomalies in, inside the pathology I was studying from normality to disease. Okay? And deep learning is also doing this with complex networks. It also learns an, uh, a representation of the nonlinear space uh, where my, the data belongs. So it's exactly doing the same, reducing dimensionality and, and, and going further. So it's, here is an illustration for cardiac segmentation. So following the track here, complexity of the question model. So dimensionality of the data. So clinicians work on this kind of markers that we try to handle also, so images. Uh, I have already told about the dimensionality of the images. Shapes, so shapes could be the whole shape or it could be a descriptor uh, extracted from the shape. So it could be the curvature or the fibers attached to the mesh. It could be also functional features attached to the mesh. So uh, the motion or the deformation that I may extract from the mesh or the electrical activation. So we have a lot of markers, 2D, 3D, sometimes with specific constraints like fibers, uh, or strain, like they have a specific structure that we should uh, handle. And we have constraints due to the physiology. These are 4D data, or eventually f f 5D data, I would say, if we have a follow-up from a given acquisition to one year later, for example. So actually, there's a high dimensionality of the data, which, which is really challenging. And what about noise on the data? Just following the examples. Well. I wouldn't like to assume that my data perfectly lies on the space I have the intuition that it should belong to. Because if I take one sample, okay, one sample could be one subject, or this sample could be one acquisition at a given instant for this subject, one image for this subject, or one measurement. And by doing a measurement, I assume that I may have uncertainty in doing my measurement. Okay, so that I don't believe that we should assume that samples should lie exactly on the population space, but we may have some freedom around. We hypothesize that they are quite close from this space, but we have uncertainty in the subjects because of this. And the key point here is that when designing algorithms, we should take into account this to really have algorithms that take into account this, this noise around the data and not really stick to the points so that they're generalizable enough. OK? So just to, to warp up things before thinking about simulations, now we have a bit of overview of the challenges for learning and learning in cardiac imaging. And the clinicians we were talking about, uh, with on Monday, they were saying, OK, we can provide you 5,000 data, 1 million data, I don't know. But with this, this amount of data, we, we, you don't need simulating cases. So just before simulating, just let's see the, the panorama of uh, databases. So for the general population, like people acquired, like suppose healthy and, and to see where the disease arrives, I've put three examples, but I'm sure there are others. So I like the Cardiac Project Initiative from uh, Auckland in New Zealand because they, are, they, they, they have access to many databases, among which there is the MESA study, like thousands of cases. And it's shape data, uh, several modalities. For the moment, they're doing uh, lots of shape statistics on this. There's an initiative from the clinical side, like the European Association of uh, Cardiac Imaging. Even though I don't know so much on this, but it's highly advertised. They promise 1,000 cases, but in the first publications, they are with 400 cases. So it's echocardiography or supposed normal cases with suitable 3 echo. And there is this one, the UK Biobank, that is at the moment uh, quite a hot topic because they plan uh, 100,000 cases. And for the moment, they've granted access upon certain conditions to 5,000 5, cases. Uh, this is MRI data mainly. 
uh, or the data I know for the moment. So we can already do a lot of things with, us, with this amount of data, but it depends on the question we settle on, on this data. And just remind that this is the general population, and actually sometimes we don't reason like this. So for specific populations, like when you have a pathology, actually the key point is really settling your question, the question you want to answer. Do you I want to do a segmentation? So maybe I don't know to really think so much and I just take the amount of data I have. If I'm interested in diagnosis or better understanding the disease, well, I, I believe that there are two points of view that we've seen through the PhD of Sergio that is uh, at, uh, at Barcelona. So he designed a, a machine learning algorithm that worked with a, a cohort from, a, a, let's say, a population from Alan Fraser in Cardiff, uh, which was like 100 and something cases, but a well-designed population with a very well-identified question. So the, his algorithm why, was quite interesting on this data. And then afterwards, we transferred this algorithm to a bigger cohort uh, from uh, Boston in the United States, the MADID CRT trial, which is 3,000 cases. But like, we were really challenged by the, the question because was there a question about this data? So actually, there's the physiologist's point of view about data, like they pick a population, coherent population, they really focus on understanding what happens in this population, uh, but with the disadvantage that this may be a small population or a too controlled population, uh, too small subsets. So when you move already multicentric, you may see changes on this. And when you move to cohorts, well, you have much more data, thousand cases, more heterogeneous, but that's real life data. And you need to resettle your question. So do you want to do classification? Like you do, a, you give a medicine and you want to see who responds or do not respond to the medicine, or I mean, uh, integration points. So that's a large population and a real life question. So for this, I believe, like once you've settled your question, you may think about simulating. And the key question is the realism of your simulations. Simulations are models, as machine learning is a model. So how far do we need to go in terms of realism? Okay, so the, that's the key challenge, being realistic enough in simulations, okay? I, I like that one, it's really, <laughs> really impressive, real, but it's not real, realistic enough, maybe for my real life data, so. So the level one, I would say, of uh, realism in simulations is gathering practice. And it's nice because it fits a bit the definition of learning by humans, maybe. So when you have a simulator for uh, pilots in a plane, it's not really striking in terms of realism, but they gather experience with respect to the task they're asked for, like driving uh, in, into a control environment, driving a plane. The same with this kind of game we've all played when we were children. It's not realistic at all, but we are gathering experience with respect to a given task that is simple, that is not realistic, but still it's kind of a simulation that enhances our process of learning with respect to this. So more realistic things, I think there's a huge amount of uh, industrial solutions regarding, let's say, not realistic simulators, but still for uh, clinicians to learn how to put the echo probe, how to settle the views and these kind of things. So here is a, a, a review article about this thing. And in this room, apparently, there's a lot of, uh, of, of these simulators. So you see a, a, a synthetic torso. Uh, and just by doing the imaging, they, they have the images provided by, by the different uh, tools that image, that, that simulates even if not really realistic, that simulates uh, the heart, okay? So here, the purpose is not really mixing with your, your data that you will be studying, because it's not realistic enough, but still it's gathering practice. So that's the first purpose. The same for electrophysiological data. I found yesterday this, this kind of, um, 
of uh, application, like uh, from Schiller, that does the same. That's a not really realistic model, but for learning purposes, uh, you can see like in, there's a nice video where they settle uh, on the synthetic model. They settle uh, the three electrodes and you see the, the changes in the signal and this kind of things. And actually it helps you probably better under understanding this, the way to understand ECGs or how to analyze this. And I like this analogy because, I mean, this is made by clinicians, kind of a decision tree about how to interpret ECGs. And actually, in machine learning, we do have a family of algorithms that try to build this kind of, of decisions. Okay, a better level of realism is trying to get realistic data, still not to be mixed with your real databases, but for partial validations. So the purpose here is to have a control environment where your population variability is conditioned by few variables about your synthetic models, so your stiffness, the size of the heart, these kind of things. And good quality data to validate your algorithms, even if not realistic enough, you partially understand what happens on your algorithms. So I think there's a shared purpose with the philosophy behind animal models, because animal models, if, even if you don't have many, many, many data, Still, there's the purpose of partially validating your data in a controlled environment. The only difference is with a computer simulation, we go with more data and in silico data. So for a, a different paper where, uh, that I will talk about afterwards, we've tried to design a synthetic database, or at least think about it. I think it's not realistic enough. But still, I, uh, I think that in the middle of your purpose, you have an algorithm, the algorithm you want to validate or design. And you want to challenge the diagnosis limit of your algorithm. Am I good enough or not? So you need samples, you need to design samples that are below and above this limit of the algorithm, so that you want to find this limit of the algorithm. So you design a database, so in our case we were trying to design infarcts, so from like we were alterating the volume, the size of the, the infarcted zone on the computer model, and the viability of the tissue, kind of stiffness. So we built randomly a database with these two parameters, and we were trying to find a question, or what, what is our algorithm that goes for this? Do I want to diagnose infarct, and what's my limit for diagnosis infarct? And there's two side questions in this that are actually related to the simulation is what's the limit to detectable disease, so maybe by humans, like if I look at my synthetic data, is there a barrier that's maybe below my algorithm's limit where I cannot distinguish between healthy and disease data? And the second thing is, is there an, an upper limit about the realism of my simulations? Okay, so I think these questions we may keep in, in, in our mind and, and see later. Well, level three of simulations is being realistic enough so that we can mix our synthetic data with real data. And that's actually something that is partially done with neural networks. That's the data augmentation. Like many, many strategies, they do this. So if you have your classification stage, you see that here and here, there are things that are called data warping and feature warping. It's actually augmenting your database with real data, but you've warped a bit so that you have more example. You're more robust to this. So for example, if you want to recognize digits, a common strategy is to really rotate your data in many, many orientations, or add noise, or change the brightness of the, your data, so that you have, instead, from one sample, you have many, many samples. And this is actually a very useful strategy and commonly used data augmentation strategy for uh, neural networks. So these are some results for, uh, from, uh, from the, taken from this blog that took on, on a digital recognition challenge, many algorithms, and uh, compared the reported results without and with data augmentation. So there's a huge, in, huge increase in performance. And the data augmentation was, for example, shifting uh, 
your, um, your images or applying affine transformations or these kind of things. So in this case, we're in, in, the, in the side where simulation is easy to do, but you really provide much more samples. You have a real benefit for your task, but that's clearly identified task. So for images, basically it's kind of rotating, scaling, changing the brightness. For text recognition, it's also possible to design synthetic sentences to augment your data, to have much more data so that your algorithm performs better. And for medical imaging, well, it's a bit more complex. So on some images, it starts to be, uh, to be done, like to recognize, um, uh, for example, how do you say, lunares, uh, well, the black uh, dots on your skin. Sorry? Moles, yeah. So it starts to be done. Uh, but now we need to resettle for cardiac imaging. Where's our current, recurrent assets with respect to these really naive simulations? Well, we have realistic physiological models. Okay, so why not, I mean, let's use them and let's see how far we can get. The only thing is that, as I said before, we should keep in mind that this is really complex, so we may not represent the whole population of human beings, but really tackle specific populations and see what we can do with simulation on these populations. So some examples from computer vision which were quite successful. So this you may not see on the projector, but this is an image from a video game. Okay? So what people start to do now for having self-driving cars, they need to know where is the road, where is the car, where is the tree, etc. And what they start to do is training their model on video games because they are quite realistic. You have many, many, many data, 10, 000, uh, 10 power 10 of, uh, of samples of pixels uh, corresponding to road buildings, etc. So that's a huge amount of data. And with this, I think it's not too far from real life data, or at least it really helps uh, performing better on, on real data. That's the first step. It's not so, that's not cardiac imaging, but. Um, then there was this paper in 2014 that uh, I liked the idea because they wanted to automatically find orientations of this, uh, I think, surgical tool uh, in these images. So I don't know really much about these images, but actually, if you look at these images, they're quite, uh, let's say, you have a background, your medical image, and then you have the, the, the clinician's tool that is here. In vivo data, they just had 68 sequences from 22 patients. So designing a learning algorithm on these data wouldn't be so much, so, so good. And w what they've seen from these images is that it's possible to really simulate, so these are simulated uh, tools. Uh, so you have ground truth about its orientation, its size, etc., and you can have much more data. Okay, so that's kind of easy to simulate, I would say, uh, thing, but where you clearly see the benefits of simulating data on this. So the key issue is in cardiac imaging, how far are we from real data? So the ways to quantify this is given your task. You want to do just feature extraction. So we are able, as we've seen on Monday, we are able to simulate highly realistic data. So we don't maybe really care about the, the disease, the dynamics of the disease, if you just want to do segmentation. But still, we may benefit a lot from simulated data. For diagnosis, it's much more complex. And I told several times that it may not be that easy. Then regarding the realism of your data, then there's a whole field of research that, that goes for this. So actually, in the previous method I've shown, it may look realistic, but still this population may be statistically a bit different from this population in terms of distribution of something. So the key point, if you want to use this simulated data to learn on real data, there's a transfer to do. I mean, these data are not directly usable, and that's actually my, a whole field of research. So the idea of transfer learning, like a very uh, simple way, is 
that you are able to train your algorithm on a given database for which you may have many data. So this should be real data or synthetic data. And you would like to apply then your pre-trained net network or algorithm on your data, which is a much smaller database. And the key issue is bridging together, I mean, these, these, two, uh, these two populations. Like, what should I do? Should I just adjust the brightness of my um, images? Should I try to look at the statistical distribution of some features and try to adjust correct for bias in the statistical distributions? So I won't enter into detail, but keep in mind that this is the, the, the whole field of research tackling this. And the actual challenge is, is, is this. You, you have your real data that belongs to a given space, your simulated data that, given, that belongs to another space, and the key challenge is like at least have partial overlap or bring these two spaces close together. So then I'll go for some examples uh, from the previous group I was working with. I really looked at in, onto the internet to find uh, examples of cardiac synthetic databases that were used for machine learning. But um, you may help me if I miss some examples. But I apologize that these examples are from my previous group and I didn't really find so many other examples. So the first one is from uh, uh, using the INRIA model of uh, like the electrophysiological, the electro electrophysiological part. And uh, the purpose was to try to be able to simulate uh, these kind of signals to avoid a, a, a loud, um, let's say, pipeline for the patients. So the key idea was from late enhancements and invasive measurements to be able to simulate realistic enough uh, EGMs, so uh, electrical signals, that can be uh, differentiated between the same way that we could differentiate uh, clinical data on this. So I'm not really a specialist of this work, so you may ask Maxim that is in the room for more detail, but that's the first idea of simulating data, getting close enough from the real data, but with a clearly identified question. A second work that uh, we try to work uh, with Maxim and uh, Mathieu that are here is using the, the synthetic model of uh, INRIA and another one that we develop here at, uh, at Creatis. So, to solve this question, if I have deformation data from echocardiography, may I avoid doing a late enhancement to a patient? May, sometimes it's not possible. But still, from deformation, can I infer the position of the infarct? So it's a challenging problem. And just to validate the algorithm, we designed mesh data and uh, launched our, our algorithms on this. So we've tried to design realistic infarcts. So from the model, we said that this is the region covered by uh, coronary artery. And we said that the infarcts have a random shape. They start from the endocardium. And we have an algorithm to generate this kind of infarcts. So I don't know how realistic they are. Uh, and we've tried to generate a population so this is the average of all the infarcts we've generated. So they are all located into the, this territory. And they're small, big, but they cover the whole set of possibles in this population. Compared to our real data where infarcts are more or less located here. So for learning, learning on synthetic data may be more challenging here, even if it's not a really realistic database. It may be more realistic because we have much more vari variability of our infarcts, but we have much more samples. So the transfer to real data, here there is still a gap because the problem may be not so challenging on real data, but we have much less samples. So these are some examples of simulated deformation patterns. So the first row is real data. And the other ones are simulated data from the Creatis model or the INRIA model. And you see that 
okay, it's not maybe so realistic. We have much more mesh elements. Uh, I don't know. So here is the, the key issue of how transferable are my results from the synthetic data to my real data. Obviously, synthetic data I have much more samples. My algorithm, it's, it's a controlled environment. I trust my deformation patterns. While for real data, I may not fully trust my deformation patterns. So I may have a perfect prediction on synthetic data and using the same algorithm, it's not really the same on real data. So I think here there is still a gap between synthetic and, and, and real, the real databases. Uh, then, not just using mesh data, but we have seen that we can generate image sequences. So there was uh, actually another framework uh, to generate uh, synthetic images that is a bit different from uh, the one uh, Olivier presented. Uh, that was from Aditya Prakosa, who worked in, uh, at INRIA. And it's not, uh, the, the basic pipeline is more or less the same, but it, it's not really simulating the physics of image formation, but it's warping existing data to your model. So it's a bit different. But the challenge here was also to try to infer, um, uh, it was more on electrophysiological data, and to see if from images we can uh, we can better predict uh, this data. Okay, so the, the pipeline was actually simulating a lot of realistic images and using a regression algorithm to, 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 to be trained on this data. So instead of having one image for a single case, they've, they've designed a lot of configurations with electrical abnormalities up to uh, 100 uh, samples for a given case, which is much better for your prediction. And this is the last work I've done uh, before arriving at uh, Creatis. Following this, we have tried to improve a bit uh, this pipeline and try to have realistic uh, magnetic resonance images uh, with, for example, some pathologies, some infarcts here. And actually, that's the, the small uh, scheme I've shown before. The challenge was which, how to design the infarcts in our database. So we've tried to cover ranges of stiffness of the tissue. We've tried to cover uh, the a certain amount of locations of uh, your, your, your infarcts, still in, uh, in a given territory. But here, I mean, the only thing is that when designing this, we're saying, okay, it's nice to have synthetic data. It's very interesting to find the limits of diagnosis of your algorithm. But what was the diagnosis? I mean, it's, it's a bit complex still to, to find an algorithm or to find a key question on these data. So this is the a surrogate for deformation, I would say, that we have from the ground truth, so from the simulated meshes. And if we say we want to validate algorithms or to use machine learning algorithms that will work on motion, we still have to extract motion from the simulated images. So for this, we've used uh, registration along the sequence. And obviously, registration makes some errors. And we still have the difference that we have on the synthetic meshes. It's not exactly the same that we have on the synthetic images, because to extract these features, we've gone through an algorithm that makes some errors. So here is like the, the idea of we're trying to close the gap and getting closer to real life data to be used, so we're moving from meshes to images. But then behind this is your clinical question and also the fact that you will, you will need some algorithms that may make some errors, so a real challenge. So just a bit to conclude, I don't know if I'm too fast or not, but we can have a discussion afterwards. So I think there's a lot of space for improvement. First in the personalization of the models. So the synthetic models, with, there's still some challenges to be to fit to the, the real data. Simulating pathologies, obviously, we're not realistic enough for the moment, but it's really encouraging on some pathologies. Going for more real life images, I think Olivier, you've talked about this. Uh, would like to get more variety of textures, 
uh, adding artifacts, uh, no warping, it's for the method I've, uh, I've shown here. But the key question is the database design and really think about which cases I want to simulate, not for validating a feature extraction algorithm, but for like maybe going to diagnosis using learning algorithms. This obviously depends on the complexity of the question, but your model itself, the dimensionality of the, of the data and the noise on your data. And obviously it's conditioned by the fact that we're trying now to gather more and more data. And <coughs> there are some initiatives to share data. So, I mean, these are these two competi competing fields of generating synthetic data to fill in my real data. And in the meantime, we have access to much more and more data. So we need to, to see where to, to sit. Okay, so my take home message is that there's still a gap between simulation and real data, but we're trying to, to fix this. Okay. Thank you very much. So are there any questions for Nicola? So yeah, just to comment, I think the, um, it's true that in terms of the, the realism of the simulations, we still have a lot to do because what we saw in this, uh, in this uh, winter school is that we have a way, let's say, to uh, generate a synthetic motion field and copy and paste it on a, on a real, uh, on real image, but we don't have many ways yet to uh, let's say, make a synthetic geometry, make a, a synthetic image with any geometry. And I think that's still a, a big limitation to uh, a lot of these, these ideas for doing data augmentation because mm. we are still <laughs> a bit stuck in terms of geometry with the database we have and with all the images we have. So, But maybe it's fine for uh, if you want to do segmentation or tracking, maybe it's enough with what we have. But like for diagnosis, I think that's a big question. Exactly. So it's true that the, the tracking could be maybe the <laughs> a next target to go for. Uh, I mean, first of all, thanks, uh, Nicola, for the, the really interesting talk. Uh, my question is a bit on, uh, maybe it's a silly question, it's, it's on problems where you have a, quite a strong class imbalance. So, for example, for the database you mentioned, I imagine you have, say, 90% of very healthy, normal cases, and then you might have for a rare disease, like, half a percent or a fraction of a percent. Mm -hmm. uh, do you, uh, is your strategy usually to target the augmentation to those very small classes or do uh, you? That's actually the, uh, a possibility actually to use the, the data from the other, I mean, the data you may have for many cases to augment rare diseases. The, the only problem, this, these diseases are rare, and I suppose the pathophysiology that is behind is complex. So will we be able to reproduce this? I mean, I don't know. But yeah, that's, that would be the one possibility. Um, thanks for the great talk. Just uh, maybe uh, some kind of generic question, but I'm always wondering when we see these millions of parameters uh, isn't it methods that by constructions are overfitting in a way and in the medical domain where uh, patients can have a huge viability, there will always be sometimes where you're going to get some uh, kind of outlier from your training. So how do you see the, the impact really uh, on the clinical uh, routine of all these uh, huge uh, methods? I mean, how many years and decades to train of, for all the viability you can see in, uh, in uh, I would say there's it's, for example, on segmentation, yeah, there's millions of parameters, but uh, it's very high quality for the moment. I mean, with respect to what we had uh, before. And the purpose is still to keep a manual uh, interaction, for example, in segmentation, so that the radiologists will, won't have to, to segment easy cases. They will be pre-segmented but still he has the hand for uh, the challenging cases. So behind this, obviously, there is the, 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 the strong idea of, am I able to say this one is badly done, and then I, I leave the hand for, to, the, to the cardiologist for that, that moment. Yeah, I agree. Something that we also believe is very important at Philips is to, 
to collect the feedback, let's say, <laughs> and it's something that is usually not so not really done. You train a on a big database and you do that very statically. And I think you, what you need to do also is to see the cases uh, where the physician needs to correct and to also do the statistics on these corrections because they are the. Any other question? People are getting a bit cold. <laughs> Okay. If not, we go for a walk in the sun oh <laughs> before <yeah>. coffee. <coughs> okay, so let's thank Nicola again. Thank you very much. Yeah.